spoiler alert, you're going to die. <laughs> I'd like to invite you to take off your shoes. We're going to go on a journey, if you feel comfortable. I'm going to do it. So hello, lovely to meet you. It's been great connecting so far. <clears throat> Has anyone here been to Oregon? So summer 2022, my mom and I take a three-day road trip down to the Oregon coast. Um, I drove us to Cannon Beach. Do you know it? It's a beautiful beach. It's this long, stunning beach with a massive mountainous rock so close to where the water meets the sand. They're in the movie The Goonies, these rocks, right? You've seen that. It's West Coast rugged. The air smells like ocean salt, and the sun was warm on our faces. We were walking along barefoot, toes sinking into the warm sand. Moving through that dense, squishy surface, we were laughing and feeling awe at the space. We were laughing in surprise because my mom didn't expect the sheer size of the rocks as we came around the corner of the beach. She'd never been there before. We were loving how majestic they are, and a movement on the sand caught our attention. We looked down to see a soft, tiny black bunny running across the sand, just rushing past us into the bushes. We both squealed in delight. Look at the bunny! Oh my gosh, it was so exciting, and it was so peaceful. A, a peace like safety and connection, how we moved together, how we laughed, the beach and the bunny. You know, it felt like we could breathe. Those vast cliffs, so tall and solid, slowly changing into the sand we felt beneath our feet. Each epoch part of our world, each phase of the rocks, beautiful. The backdrop of the earth that day was the setting for the soft, swift joys of life whizzing past us so fast. Finding out what was wrong took so long. A doctor misdiagnosed her symptoms. Unnecessary testing put mom through agony and no one caught why. Meanwhile, her cancer grew so rapidly that a foot of her colon had to be removed once they finally figured out what was going on. She was in the hospital for a month and came home. Three weeks later, she was dead. But why is it so hard to talk about this stuff? Joyce Graham, my mother, she deserved to be present with her feelings and with her family. Instead, she was juggled around by an impersonal system. We have a healthcare system that puts its focus on cost effectiveness and profit. This is inhuman. And I want something different for me and for you. When you resign yourself to living and dying according to the expectations of culture, you sacrifice peace and connection, and what could be the most meaningful end of life stage for you and for your family. Most people view, view death as something so awful, shameful, and horrifying that like any awful, shameful, and horrifying thing, they naturally long to ignore it. We all die. But the way that our culture encourages us to ignore that fact is as insane as saying you ought to be ashamed of yourself for being born. Hey, do you need oxygen to survive? Don't let anyone know that you rely on oxygen to get through the day. Shame on you. Do you like water? Ugh, don't come near me with those dirty hydration cravings. But what we can't ignore any longer are three ways that culture keeps us afraid of aging and dying. Isolation, inauthenticity, and exhaustion. My mom came from a generation and an upbringing where it was unsafe to voice her feelings. We also find this difficult because our culture has taught us that only good feelings are okay to express. We feel guilty when we tell Tim Hortons that they got our order wrong. What about asking for support, or talking about death. I don't think so. Before any official diagnosis, mom was in a lot of pain. 
my sister and I at first began suggesting that she go to the hospital since her doctor was missing in action. She didn't want to hear it. We grew frightened and started pushing her harder to check into emergency, and she pushed back. Finally, she was able to say to us, I don't want to be told what to do. Oh my God, sorry. We thought it was just our mom being stubborn, but it was actually a woman trying to tell us that she just wanted to be in control of her own life. Good grief. I'm a professional caregiver. I'm an RMT and I work in hospice. I work with the seniors and I was mortified when I realized that I had succumbed to my fear of losing her and stopped listening to her. This stuff is difficult, even for individuals who have trained to listen like me. Even I need understanding, the opportunity to talk things through, and a community to help support me. We can't do this alone, and we are so alone. In November 2023, the World Health Organization designated loneliness as a global public health concern. Right now, over 40% of seniors in Canada, 85 and older, live alone. That's the population of Iceland going about their day, not talking to anyone. No good morning, good night, no hugs. Seniors that live alone are the most vulnerable and face the highest risk of negative health outcomes due to their living arrangements. For several years before COVID hit, I ran a massage therapy outreach at a care home with my students. It was a beautiful place where my students and I offered weekly massage therapy, which includes compassionate presence, therapeutic touch, and unlike the mainstream medical systems, we gave them a bit of fucking humanity. And when the world shut down, we were not considered essential workers. It's funny, isn't it? Kind touch was not considered important. During just the first three months of the shutdown, over 14,000 Canadians died. And a wildly disproportionate amount of those deceased were our olders living in senior residences, more than 80%. And because no visitors were allowed, most of these folks were alone when they died. After 18 months of enforced isolation, we were allowed to return. And one of the first people I saw was Marion. She spoke of the horror of being shut in her room, isolated from the other residents and the staff. And she spoke of her best friend dying of loneliness. She let me know that she would rather die than live like a shadow. The antidote for isolation, depression, and anxiety is connection. Many of you here today have busy lives. You're trying to get things done, get people to school, make dinner, enjoy a night out. When something happens, a broken arm, you lose a job, you get a diagnosis that chills you and your family to the bone. Your world shifts, but your friends and family rally round. Things get done. You show people how grateful you are as they remind you how important you are to them. Healing is done not in lengths of gauze or paper cups of pills, but in compassion, in dignity and tenderness for our common humanity. To know that we matter, that we belong, that what we do for those we love, we too will receive. It actually doesn't take that much, just one caring human. That can change everything. Having just one caring human around is an extraordinarily powerful thing. It's a literal painkiller. I have patients who call me human Ativan. <laughs> <laughs> Touch and presence are the original antidepressants. Being seen and loved, even just by one person, gives us a sense of purpose. In this chaotic world, that deep human relief knowing that we matter. I would consider that essential. I want to show you that we can, in fact, build a community where caring humans abound. And all we need to do to start is to start speaking up about it. 
When we have the courage to consider how we feel about aging and dying, we understand more fully how to live authentically. We remember that the commercials with perfect skin and perfect homes and perfect family holidays are fake. We remember ourselves. But why is it so hard to remember? Because we're steeped in disgust for aging. When looking young is the ideal, we are ashamed for the smallest wrinkles at the grocery store checkout lines, in the media, and in the doctor's office. Ageism is so deeply ingrained in the culture that we think it's normal. We think it's acceptable. The anti-aging industry is worth $67 billion a year, and it's going to rise to $120 billion a year over the next six years. Selfie culture exists because people don't feel seen. Our lives have become more like rushed photo ops than meaningful experiences with our families, friends, and communities. This culture feels inauthentic. Families are swamped just to afford the cost of living. People are starved of time and money and aren't able to surround our olders with love and compassion. This is an isolated bootstrap method of family caregiving, and it gives us limited options. So our only option then becomes to send the aged away and lump them together for convenience. Why? So we can serve the economy and keep working instead of our loved ones? We are the sandwich generation caring for parents while still having children at home. We're so busy that it's difficult to imagine doing any more than we already do. This culture feels like exhaustion. My mom died December 9th, 2022. She was only with us for a few short months after her colon cancer diagnosis. She wanted to die at home and we longed to give this to her, but we didn't have the physical or emotional support, the financial capability, or the medical team to do that. And let's face it, we were also scared of all the unknowns that we'd never faced before. We did give her the memorial of her dreams. And the ceremony to spread her ashes along with our dad's ashes that she'd kept for 12 years was gorgeous and meaningful and exactly where she wanted it to be. But. I wish we'd been able to create the space for a death that felt as meaningful. What could we have done to make her hospital room and our presence feel more like home? If we'd had the courage to talk about it, she could have died on her terms. Many of you look pretty young right now, but over the next 30 years, you may be entering your end of life stage. So what if we started talking about that now? What if you decided how you'd like things to go, uh, be when you die? What if your death could feel like the most exquisite, connected, and awe-inspiring journey? There are people who have beautiful experiences while they're actively dying. I have a friend whose dad lived on a Gulf Island here in BC for several decades. He was a perpetual Boy Scout. His house was inside a grove of big old trees. He loved the forest and its creatures and getting to live on his own terms. She visited many times through the years, and when her father neared the end of his life, she and her husband came to be by his side. As his health declined, she was amazed at how the community began leaning in to surround them with care. They were offered nourishment on many levels. The islanders spent time feeding them, came for visits and board games, to talk to and love on her dad, and tell them how much they appreciated what he had been to them. Palliative nurses would check in so sweetly, full understanding of who he was as a person, and the village leaned in closer whenever their needs deepened. By his side, singing to him and holding his hand for days, she was able to do what felt right instead of what the culture thought she needed to do. Even the hummingbirds that her dad loved so much came to pay their respects, not only one or two, but in the hundreds and not only on the day of his death, but also on the day of his memorial, six months later. The people of the island call this death magic, and it left her and the village profoundly moved, more able to trust the cycles of life on this earth. Here's the thing, 
The scenarios we fear become more painful to think about and more uncomfortable to talk about when we avoid them. The problem with ignoring scary things is that time doesn't wait. The soft, swift joys of life whiz past us so fast. Dan Levy says there's community in grief if we can be open about it. When we hold ourselves with compassion, eventually these conversations, like walking on sand, start to feel grounding, peaceful, and nourishing. This journey really doesn't have to suck. We get to choose to leave a legacy, to surrender to death magic and a connection to mystery, where the forest and its creatures guide a soul back into the earth. We just have to start speaking up. And this, my friends, is how we can change the world. Thank you.